Welcome back to Advices Radio. I'm Scott McNally, and up next with me is back on the microphone, Dr. Dean St. Mart. Thank you for being with us, Dean. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Scott. It's great to be back again. Yeah, like great. I said, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of the podcast, so I'm really glad that you offered me to come back on. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. One more note I didn't mention was that we are sponsored by True Nutrition. Uh, you could use our code Advices for additional savings. And uh, you know what? I, I want to tell you, man. Um, I went back and I listened to the episode we had done before. And uh, since that time, I feel like I've, I've gathered a little bit more education myself. And there were things you had said in that first episode that didn't quite make sense to me at the time. It was a little bit over my head. And, and I'll be honest, some of it still is over my head. But I, I was able to grasp a few more pieces. And so listening back, it was like hearing it again for the first time. And it was like, Oh, okay. This this okay. makes sense to me now, and so I'm really excited to bring you back and maybe go over some of the stuff we did before and talk a little bit more uh, in depth uh, about some of the same topics. Mainly, we're yeah. going to focus on some health supplements. And thank you very much. First of all, uh, I got this package in the mail uh, after we started talking about this stuff. Dr. Dean actually sent me uh, his line of products that he has formulated for supplement needs. I just had my lab work done. I, I was waiting a few days. I, I wanted to crack the bottles open and just start taking new stuff, you know? But I wanted to get, <laughs> I got my labs done. And so now I'm going to incorporate a couple of these products. Specifically, I'm interested in your liver stack and your sleep stack. And then I'm gonna see how those things benefit me. And I thought today those would be great places to start and talk about uh, how these products work. I didn't wanna just do this, and I know you don't wanna just do this as just like a plug for your company and for what you're doing. But more yeah. so as an education, these are supplements that first and foremost you you formulated because you believe in, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, everything that I put together with supplement needs has come from like a clinical approach of using stuff that I know based off the biochemistry which work. Okay. So there's no filler products. There's no filler ingredients. Everything that's in the supplements are there for a reason. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I stood by when I joined Lee, who owned Supplement Needs. I said to him, if you're going to put products out, first person that comes is the customer. Yeah. It's a person's health. I don't care about margins. I don't care about earning money. I care about making products which work. And then, of course, if you earn money in the process, that's great. But the key focus or our mission statement would be uh, the health of keeping bodybuilders and even general population have started to use these supplements. So like we talked about in the last time with the sleep stack, that came about from my own personal insight into figuring out, well, what drives us to sleep? What are the biochemical pathways? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to put it up on the screen, the, the sleep slide. I mean, it might make sense if people are following on Facebook. Let's see. All right. Um, now where is this at? I'm looking at first we have the heart uh, stuff, more heart. Okay, third, I, I, third, third slide. Okay, so, I, I got that one up now. And we have uh, understanding the functional mechanisms for sleep. Okay, we're looking at that slide right now, then, Dean. Understanding the functional mechanisms of sleep, and then I don't know what the hell I'm looking at, but there's a bunch of stuff underneath that. <laughs> So, so if people are following along, they, they'll make, it'll make sense now as to why I developed the sleep stack. So what we're looking at here is what's known as the biopterin pathway. It's a biochemical pathway okay. which feeds off into how neurotransmitters are synthesized in your brain. Okay. And then also dealing with how those neurotransmitters are actually cleared or metabolized. So what we're more interested with when we're talking about sleep is the conversion of serotonin from tryptophan. Okay. So if you look on the, the top left or in the middle, you'll see tryptophan. Okay. It's that right get, here. That gets, that gets converted to 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, which okay. is the, the it, it's more metabolically active than tryptophan. Hmm. So you then have this carrier protein, DCC, which converts 5-HTP to serotonin. Okay. So serotonin is the ha happy hormone or the har hormone that brings on, you know, relaxation at night time. Yeah. So we want to be in a state of high serotonin when we're going to sleep. That makes sense. We also know, we also know then that carbohydrates at bedtime, because of how they influence 
the shuttling of specific amino acids like tryptophan into the brain, mm. that they will also increase serotonin production because of that increased tryptophan uptake. Okay. Now, if you take 5-HTP by itself, you're relying on that transporter DCC to, to bring it into your brain to make serotonin. Hmm. But that enzyme or that carrier requires vitamin B6, so it's very difficult to see, but you have a little green arrow Yes. B6. Right next to the that, DDC, correct? Yeah, yeah. And so that means that that's what the cofactor for that enzyme is. Okay. So in order for 5-hydroxytryptophan to get into the brain, it needs vitamin B6. Hmm. Okay. So with that in mind, I chose to include pyridoxin 5-phosphate. Okay. So, pyridoxin is vitamin B6. Is that a certain type of B6? Because I've never seen so because you have it labeled here as P5P, correct? Yeah, correct. So you have P5P, which is pyridoxin 5-phosphate. So vitamin B6 is also known as pyridoxin. The cheaper form of pyridoxin would be pyridoxin HCL. Okay. You'll see that in a lot of B complexes. Unfortunately, when a B vitamin needs to be phosphorylated for in order to be uptaken correctly into your cells. Yeah. So that's exactly what P5P is. It's the pyridoxin, the phosphorylated version of pyridoxin. Okay, interesting. So it's the more active form of vitamin B6. And, and it sounds like it's probably going to be a little bit more costly for you to use that in your product as well. <laughs> It is, but you'd be surprised at how cheap some of these ingredients are versus pyridoxin. Oh, okay. Now, I, don't know, I don't know why some people choose to put these um, inferior ingredients into their products, hmm. whereas that they don't have a, an appreciation for the biochemistry or it is mm. just a cost factor. Okay. Because um, we all know about, uh, this is another tangent, but vitamin B6's effects then on lactotropes and lowering prolactin yeah yeah and how, how it affects dopamine metabolism okay um so p5p in, is probably better to take in that scenario than vitamin b6 interesting okay so with that in mind those would be the first two ingredients which i put into the sleep stack so you're increasing serotonin with the 5 htp getting converted with the pyridoxin 5 phosphate so now you have this big pool of serotonin in your brain and you're feeling nice and relaxed and it's you know, you're, you're in the state where you're getting ready for sleep. Yeah. What we can do there then is that is helping you fall asleep. The other side of it is then how we stay asleep. Hmm. This is what I was touching on the last time. Yeah, because so, I, I remember this because there there's different. I mean, I've, I've had insomnia, but insomnia can mean different things, right? You know, you could have yeah. a hard time falling asleep, hard time staying asleep. Those are and what you told me then from the last show was that these two things are very different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so falling asleep, again, I've probably skipped over the right-hand side of the graph, uh, the, the biochemical pathway. So on this right-hand side, you can see we have dopamine at the top, and that feeds into norepinephrine, and then into epinephrine, and then obviously they get cleared from your brain. So that's the degradation pathway there. But if we think of high dopamine when we're trying to sleep at night, yeah. That's, you know, our, our, our drive to impulse neurotransmitter. It's the one that's making us, you know, be ambitious and, you know, overactivity of thinking of things within our brain. Right. We, we want to have a low dopamine setting for when we're going to sleep. Mm, okay. So if you follow off downwards, you'll see COMT, which is what we talked about the last time. So CMT is one of the enzymes which clears catecholamines like dopamine from our brain. So okay. COMT, COMT is catechol O methyl transferase. So what it does is it puts a methyl group, which is like a CH3 in chem chemistry. It's a it's a molecule that we use to switch on and off genes. I've heard Scott speak about it a couple of times in the show. So if anyone wondering is wondering, methylation is in its simplest form. We donate these CH3 methyl groups two snips of our DNA to switch on and off genes. Okay. So what we need to do here is, with same with COMT, that is transferring this methyl group to dopamine to inactivate it, basically. Okay. So it's the, in, in, in okay. And then this is, this is, so you're saying that we need COMT to basically neutralize the norepinephrine, the, the uh, dopamine. Correct. And, it, and then okay i'm i'm following you along i'm following along with you then 
Now, what gets interesting is COMT is not just involved with dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Like what I spoke about before in the last show, COMT also methylates estrogen. Mm, yes. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's a pathway for removing estrogen from the body. Yes. Now, Victoria, Victoria Falkar has been teaching me about this. So you can, and, and that's the thing, I think, that in, in bodybuilding, we're, we're so conditioned to believe that in order to control estrogen, you need to use an anti-aromatizing agent. But there's, this is a completely different pathway that you could potentially control some, some estrogen issues, is what you're telling me and what she's told me. Yeah, I mean, we can get into that when we discuss a little about the liver. Okay. But it's a completely overlooked site of estrogen metabolism when it comes to bodybuilding. Because like you said, we always look at how do we remove that conversion process of excess androgens to estrogen. Yeah. But we never look at the actual elimination and perhaps root causes that could be causing the higher estrogen. And that's this ties in now because we I didn't say this on the beginning of this episode. If people listen to the first episode, uh, what's the term that you use for yourself? Is it practical? You practice practical medicine? Is that what it's called? Functional Functional medicine. medicine, That's right. So functional medicine is not just looking for a band aid, right? Is what you had told me before. Functional medicine is looking for to actually kind of fix things from the root. Exactly. Exactly. So we're always looking at what what's driving the root cause. So, for example, someone might have high estrogen, but it not, might not be an artifact of high aromatase. Okay. It might be the fact that there's a bottleneck in the liver not clearing the estrogen. Oh, okay. So the estrogen is recirculating back into the system or it's having nasty side effects. Mm. So it's it's a matter of um, figuring out where the root cause of that is. And I have a nice little pathway planner on a couple of slides later when we're talking about the liver stack that we can um, delve into a little bit if people are watching. Okay. So with the COMT, if again, if you look at COMT, this one's a tricky one because if you look in purple, we have serotonin. So serotonin slows down COMT, hmm. but yet we've created a high serotonin environment to fall asleep. Huh, Okay. But what speeds up serotonin is having high levels of SAM. So SAM is S adenosyl um, uh, methylmethionine. Okay. So this is that's your methyl donor. That's what gives off the methyl donor, the, the methyl group for COMT to work. Okay. We also need to have sufficient levels of magnesium for COMT to work. Mm. That is one of the cofactors of the enzyme itself. Okay. But like what we talked about in the previous podcast, a lot of people are deficient in magnesium. Yeah. So we can see that when we get to a, a contest prep set where we're taking certain compounds that can increase dopamine production, increase serotonin production, that we end up with this bottleneck at COMT when we're trying to sleep. Mm, that makes because sense. Because not only are we putting a burden on the COMT with the neurotransmitters, you may be putting a burden on, on the other pathway towards estrogen. Yeah. So you end up with this bottleneck where you're trying to fall asleep, but your brain can't because it has to try and deal with this dopamine. So what we want to do there is we want to calm that dopamine response down and again activate what we know as the um, GABA neurons within our brain, which are the inhibitory calming neurons that you know dampen brain activity. Okay. How we, how we do that is with um l-theanine was what i included so mm. there's quite a lot of quite a lot of studies surrounding l-theanine's activation towards the different subtypes of gaba receptors okay so, so quest, question just to you know as a as a layman bodybuilder here you're talking about uh the gaba receptors what why not why use l-theanine and not just take gaba gaba well recently they've been trying to prove again can GABA itself as a supplement, so if anyone's not aware, GABA is GABA aminobutyric acid. What that does is it, it, it in theory, it crosses, we can make it in our brains rather than crossing over into the blood brain barrier. Um, I'll probably take a step back. If anyone doesn't know, isn't aware, we have this huge vascular wall around our brain, okay. which excludes compounds from our brain. So it's very selective in what it allows to pass into the vascular system of our brain to have an effect. So a compound has to have a certain characteristic to be, um, I guess, lipophilic, so fat-loving enough to pass across that 
vascular system to reach our brain to have an effect. Hmm. Okay. GABA itself in humans, they've taught in the past, there, these studies were done in the late 70s, early 80s, that GABA itself could never cross the blood brain barrier. Hmm. And if it did, we're only talking about 2 or 3%. Okay. That's where they came up then with different analogues. The Russians done a lot of study here with, with phenyl GABA or phenobut. Oh, okay. So when you put a, a phenyl group, which is just an aromatic ring in chemistry, if anyone wants to Google a phenyl ring, putting that on makes the compound more lipophilic. Hmm. In that it's, now, it's now able to cross over the blood-brain barrier and get metabolized to GABA and act at the receptors. So that's how phenobut works. I had no Correct. idea. Yeah, that's awesome. Correct. Okay. Now, again, like we've seen, there are then side effects to using phenobut long-term. Sure. That they think about the possible dependency yeah. on using it long-term. Um, so that's why I avoided any of that direct GABA inhibitory compounds like putting phenobut into the sleep stack because, I again, I don't... Nothing in here is going to cause a dependency. That's good. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yep. So the only thing that may be an issue, and going back to the start, is the increase in 5-HTP. Okay. So say someone has taken antidepressants, mm. like like a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So what those drugs do is prevent serotonin from leaving the synapse, so you have more serotonin available. Right. If you were to give them 5-HTP, they may potentially end up with a case of uh, serotonin overload. Oh, okay. And that may cause very aggressive or even completely manic depressive characteristics. Sure, sure. So that's why the sleep stack needs to be taken with caution if someone has taken SSRIs and there is a, a warning on it to okay. take heed of that. That makes total uh, sense, yeah. So. Okay. Now, now we've we've gotten the brain into a lull state, so we're clearing out the dopamine using you know the magnesium and the theanine to calm GABA. The 5-HTP and the pyridoxin 5-phosphate are you know working to convert more 5-HTP to serotonin to calm us down. So serotonin, like I said, helps us to fall asleep. What keeps us asleep is melatonin. Okay. So when we are asleep, our body is producing melatonin. Hmm. And this is why, like we said the last time, if you take melatonin supplementation, it tends to give you about maybe three hours sleep. Okay. And, th and then you're done because of the fast half-life of melatonin. What we want to do is encourage the body to make its own melatonin. Mm. So again, if we follow serotonin, over to the right, we have this enzyme, AANAT. So AANAT is what's known as our biological clock. Okay. It, tell, it tells our body to start making melatonin. And where is this? Where are we at now? I got a little bit lost here. So if we, if we go to the middle where we have serotonin. Yep. We follow it over to the right. We have this A-N-A-A-T. Okay. So if we look at this, that's the enzyme, like I said, which is our biological clock to produce serotonin. Okay. So again, we can see that melatonin, which is at the bottom See the way all the arrows are pushing it across to melatonin? Yes. Serotonin makes melatonin. Mm, okay. So again, if someone's in a low serotonin environment from the potential use of, say, Trembolone, right. they're going to have issues with melatonin synthesis. Mm. And they're going to have difficulty staying asleep. Okay. So again, um, like we've seen before with the DDC enzyme, the ANAAT enzyme needs vitamin B5. Mm. You have the little B5 with the arrow. Really? Okay. So now what we need is vitamin B5 to convert serotonin to melatonin. And with that, that's why I included 500 milligrams of pantothenic acid in the sleep stack to push that serotonin to melatonin. Okay. So not only are you falling asleep faster, you're actually staying asleep longer then. Because of you're not depleting your melatonin and throughout so, the night, and so that takes care of of both aspects of what could be insomnia. So, just to kind of back up, then to make sure that I have this right, we've got a couple things going on here uh, with with what we need for sleep. A, we need to be able to reduce dopamine and norepinephrine in order right. to then 
be able to produce serotonin, but then, and that's where the 5-HTP comes in. But then from there, we still need to take that one step further to convert that into melatonin is what you're telling Correct. me. Correct. And that's Correct. basically and that, what you're attempting to do then with, with, by combining these supplements. Correct. That's so fucking and then, cool. Then the other thing, like I said before, COMT and also the um, enzyme which converts acetyl serotonin to melatonin, in those both cases, they need SAM. Now, SAM comes from methionine. Okay. So we need a methionine source in our body. So as bodybuilders, a lot of us eat a lot of protein, so we should be getting sufficient levels of methionine from our diet. Okay. In order to ensure that there is some amount of methionine going into sleep, that's why I included zinc monomethionine as the last ingredient. Huh, okay. So zinc acts obviously on so many, it's like the second most abundant um, element in our body for um, different chemical pathways. So it's involved in the central nervous system, it's involved in our testosterone production. There's so many myriads of effects to zinc that again, some people may be deficient in zinc. Hmm. So we're providing zinc on one hand, and then the other hand, we're providing a small amount of methionine to make SAMe. Hmm. Okay. To, to help with that methylation of COMT. Okay. So everything that was put in there was thought out strategically based on the sleep, the biopterin pathway of neurotransmitter production. Okay, that's interesting. That's it. So if, if you were to use a combination, I mean, obviously. You've just explained how all this works. If somebody wanted to, they could put this together themselves or they could take your product. If they were to do this, is this something that you're going to see results with on an instant basis or is it something that you need to take on a regular basis to get an effect? Uh, I've had a lot of people start this and be skeptical of it. And within two or three nights, and my God, like the, you, even using sleep trackers, even though we can't really put huge faith in the likes of a Fitbit or an Aura Ring. Yeah. The the movement data we get from it is to an extent valuable to use. As opposed to, you know, looking at the sleep cycles that it's trying to make you believe you had. Right. Um, the amount of deep sleep that people get when they take this hmm. goes up quite a lot. Huh, okay. And I have been tagged in quite a lot of um posts on Instagram and stories of people going like they've just bought it and then in a week saying like this is my sleep for the week yeah and, and the fact that there's nothing in it that's um sedative or again um habit inducing like you know benzodiazepines or any of the phenobarbitrates that people might use for sleep right that it can be used year round right right and like i said how this came about was it was my own development towards my own sleep okay so you you were developing so, this you you must have start, how did you start it out did you start out with just like a couple of these things and then build off of it yourself yeah so by by the end of my prep in 2017 i had that all together as a like a six i was just buying all the, the ingredients separately on amazon and taking them at bedtime right and man, my, my sleep for that prep was unbelievable Hell that was yeah. the first that was the first year that I was sleeping like eight hours solid per night. No kidding. That's awesome, man. And that makes such a difference too in the results that you're going to get. You know, I've worked with clients that uh, guys who had been under a great deal of stress one year and then not been under as much stress the other, been able to get full nights of sleep versus another year not being able to. I mean, it really dramatically makes a difference in how much food they can eat, how much cardio they have to do and what the results are at the end of the day. So it's, it's huge. It is, yeah, and I mean even the mental fatigue of if you have to work a full time job on top of prep. Sure. Like uh, that's where the sleep I think comes in to real effect that it's allowing you to perform your daily tasks and then prep on top of that. Yeah, no question about it. Well, that's yeah, fascinating. Like, uh, anyone that I've recommended to take that if they are, for example, like this is a disclaimer, if they are using Tremblone in a prep, yeah. Combining the sleep stack with a little bit more magnesium to help C O M T along. Yeah, most people never suffer with what we've come to term transomnia. So you think so? The transomnia is related to possibly not being able to clear the dopamine and norepinephrine. Correct, and the fact that you're depleting your serotonin oh, potential. Okay, okay. What is it now? What do you mean by that? You're depleting your possibly depleting your serotonin. What would be happening there with trend potentially to do that? So we know with. Ser serotonin the serotonin transporter can be 
negatively affected by androgens. Okay. So you may have less serotonin at our synapse. Mm. So it, that that is one of because of how heavy of an androgen um, at the binding affinity of trembolone that yeah. we see that potential effect at the the serotonin um, synapse. That make okay. That makes sense then. So it really could be any androgens, but especially something that's very strong is what you're strong, saying. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Okay. And I mean that that's where where we can go in the opposite direction that someone can get very very anxious with androgens. Oh yeah, yeah. And again. Again, the anxiousness comes from sky high dopamine. Mm, mm, yeah, that makes sense. And there you can see where what's causing that bottleneck is COMT getting overwhelmed. Yeah, because people will tell you like like that steroids are not a central nervous system stimulant, but they they, but they are. You like I can tell the difference that you know you're you're definitely more like less less restful. I think just in general, there's there's definitely a difference. It, it's not like drinking a cup of coffee is stimulated, but there's something to it. And it what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it drive. That's what I like to put it as. You get yeah. it's just an innate drive to, to do things. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Huh? Where uh, where do you want to go from here? We have uh, three other products um, that you have in your line that that we had to talk that we have on hand to talk about. What uh, um, what would you like to talk about next? Because I'm open to any of these. I'd say that the kidney and blood pressure stack is probably the easiest one to speak about. All right, all right. And then from there, I want to go to the liver. After that, cool. All right. So I'm so, gonna I'm gonna look up what's what, your slide for that one. Is that the the first? I don't have a slide. You don't have a I don't slide. Have a slide. Okay. No, then, I didn't I didn't put one together for this. Then we'll go to slide list yeah. for this one. So this one. Um, so everyone's probably aware, probably the, the person that brought it to the mainstream of bodybuilders was Dante with astragalus. Okay, yeah. So Dante was forever posting about astragalus. Um, and then obviously myself I, drove me into the literature of astragalus and also looking at potential astringents that can help cleanse the liver. Okay. Um, so obviously what we're talking about here is we want to lower creatinine or any of the byproducts that can put stress on the kidneys. Mm, okay. Um, so when we look at EGF-4, the estimated glomerular filtration rate, that's hugely driven by creatinine and its production. Okay. So it's a little unclear when you look in the literature as to how astragalus works. Hmm. But the, the basic mechanism that I can understand is that we're actually complexing and removing creatinine. We're facilitating a, a further reduction of creatinine from the blood. Okay. So there's less for the kidneys to have to filter. Hmm. And I've seen that creatinine reduction in a lot of blood work who who have taken this high dose of astragalus, which you've seen in the literature. No kidding. So we, we've didn't, like I said, we're... Supplement needs, we not spared any expense when we're making products like this. So there's eight grams of astragalus root in this product. I don't, I don't know much about it. What's, uh, what's an effective dose considered? Uh, six to eight grams would be okay. an effective dose. But a lot of companies that would sell a kidney product per, per se yeah. may only include maybe one or two grams. Okay, interesting. So we, we've included a four to one extract at eight grams, which is a really high dose. Hmm. Um, recently, I had a, a, a good friend of mine send me over some blood work of a, a close relative of theirs. And originally their EGF-4 was down in the 20s. Okay. They, they have, they have a, a known kidney issue. Mm. Um, but they were using the kidney and blood pressure stack of their own accord. Like there was no advice towards this is going to improve it but again when their EGF-4 is down at that level they're willing to take something that's natural to see what effect it has yeah after three months their EGF-4 was up at 70 which is normal kidney function no kidding huh so what we've included there is eight eight thousand milligrams or eight grams of astragalus fruit with golden rod now again when you read into the literature golden rod it doesn't really give us much mechanisms on how it works at the kidney level other than it acts as potentially a mild diuretic. So we're reducing potentially blood volume. Okay. And also acting again as an astringent to help remove some um, things from our blood. Hmm. Okay. But again, it's very unclear on its exact mechanism. Um, combining what probably drives a lot of kidney disease with bodybuilders is blood pressure. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I dare call it a laziness to not checking their blood pressure or keeping mm. their blood pressure in control. I think sometimes too, I can speak from my own experience. I've been afraid to check even, you know, I, I think to myself, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on this trend or whatever it is. And I've got seven weeks left and I want to do this, this contest, no matter what, I, I almost don't want to know at times it's the way I'd felt in the past. And thankfully I've, I've gotten through it without any kind of kidney issues. But you know, there's a lot of guys out there that I know don't even own a blood pressure cuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, someone asked me before, how do you reduce blood pressure? And my first answer to them was, like I said there, it's it's a lazy man's disease. Mm. It's, there, there's so much that can be done to remedy high blood pressure to remove its root cause than relying on, say, a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor to increase vas- uh, vasodilation. Sure. So, again... We're looking at root causes, high blood pressure. It could be driven by um, higher estrogen production from aromatase. It could be driven by, we know that steroids themselves affect other steroid receptors. One of those steroid receptors, so not only the androgen receptor, but we have, say, the mineral corticoid receptors, Mm. which would be like aldosterone. Yeah, yeah. So we know that steroids affect aldosterone and how we retain sodium. So now we're increasing water retention in that regard. Because we're holding more minerals, is what you're saying, due to the yeah. gear. Yeah, and so obviously our blood volume goes up again. And you can think of the inside of your arteries, if anyone's watching the video. So when we have higher blood pressure, our arteries are generally vasoconstricted. So the blood has to try and flow through a smaller gap to right. speak. But inside the endothelium, inside the artery, is um, spoon muscle. Okay. It's 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 actually uh, a muscle a muscle tissue. Yeah. Um. And again, what a lot of people fail to do is actually train that vascular muscle tissue to operate better. How do we train that? So how we train that is high intensity um, cardio. Use stuff to drive up our heart rate, make our heart work harder. Okay. To have to force more blood flow throughout the body. Okay. Okay. So if we think about it over time, those arteries get stiffer and stiffer. The same way if you don't train a, a specific muscle or joint, it gets stiff over time. Yeah. Your arteries end up that way. And it, it, by doing this, then it relaxes and basically it expands, gives you more room for the blood flow, right? That that it, Think of a garden hose. If you pinch that off, the pressure is going to be higher, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. And I mean, it's not only then just the hit cardio. It's also, you know, the metabolic cascade of what happens when you do hit cardio. Yeah. So... It's it's really a simple, effective way to drop blood pressure down is by being diligent with even two sessions of, you know, six or seven minute wing gates where you're going all out for six or seven minutes yeah, and then into like a steady state walk for 15 to 20 minutes. Well, when you call it a lazy man's disease, then I can see what you're saying because... I mean, I've been there myself. I don't, I don't always want to do cardio, especially if I'm had a good workout. I just want to focus on growing, and then I think to myself, "Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to compromise and lose all the muscle gains I could have if I were to just go home and eat right now." You know, but yeah, I mean, then what we can do is we can then use, I guess, natural compounds okay. like the the beetroot extract and the hawthorn. Uh, those two have a synergism. Okay. And how they cause a, an increase in the production of enos. So enos is endothelium nitric oxide synthesase. Mm. And what that does is it converts arginine into citrulline and then citrulline to nitric oxide. Okay. I should have I should have actually sent you on. I had the pathway for that. Um, but basically what, what we're doing there is we're increasing the amount of enos that's being produced. Hmm. Okay. Um, again, if we go back to sleep, yeah. a lot of people... Right now, we're, we're, we're talking. So what, obviously, when we're talking, we can't use our nose to breathe. But mm. in general, when we're at rest, people should be breathing out through their nose and in through their nose also. I've heard that, yeah. The reason for that is your nose, your nasal cavity is filled with cells that are primed to, pr- to produce enos. Hmm. So nasal breathing in itself will bring your blood pressure down naturally. Is that is that what the whole mouth taping thing has to do with? Yeah, yeah. I mean, during your sleep. Yeah, so yeah. What you're trying to do there is reset that um, pattern of mouth breathing in your sleep. Mm. 
You know, my <laughs> issue is I have a deviated septum. I can't breathe out of one side of my nose. That's that's yeah. got to be an issue. I talked to I was was with Carl Lenore at the Arnold Classic, and he told me even that each nostril functions differently. Is is is, is he onto something with that? No, no, he is because I'm the same. Because obviously I was a kickboxer we talked about it before. Yeah. So my nose is actually broke as well. My mm. septum is deviated. Yeah. So I, I get chronic sinus issues as well. Me too. I I yeah. live off of this stuff, unfortunately. Sometimes, unfortunately, I know it's not good for you, but uh, yeah, I, you can you can also develop a dependence on that. So that's I, I have, believe me, <laughs> at different times I, I have. And then it has a, a feedback where you're actually having to use that to get rid of the congestion because you're again it's induced a state of vasodilation that your body's become used to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, even like the mouth breathing versus nose breathing um up to like really high intensities of exercise we should be trying to utilize nasal breathing okay and again if we're just sitting working at our desk pay attention to how you breathe are you breathing through your mouth are you breathing through your nose um are you breathing from your diaphragm like mm. the, you could have a whole podcast i'm no expert on breathing but it, there is a huge difference between how you breathe and again how blood flows through your body yeah that makes sense i believe it I mean, I can feel it. I know that, you know, there's so much to do with breath and meditation and just stopping if I have anxiety and focusing on breath for even even five breaths. It's going to change how you feel, you know? Yeah, and even how it affects, like, one of the big things that it does affect is your vagus nerve, which connects your uh, brain to your gut. Yeah, yeah. So, the yeah, the, if anyone wants to try it, literally... Um, I know in the US they have, I think their OmniFix is what it's called. Their, okay. uh, their, their, it is mouth taping, but it's literally a piece of tape that's shaped like your lips. So I've seen that. Messy. Yeah. But but it does work. Like I, I often have to go to it because of um, with my nose. If I lie on my back, I tend to snore. Okay. So if with that, I, I can't snore. I have to breathe through my nose for the whole night. So if I go back through a pattern of snoring, I'll reintroduce mouth tape and with the uh, with use of the nasal strips. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever tried them. I have. Yeah, that'll open it up, right? Give you. Yeah, a... the nasal strips really help as well because again, it's just uh, acupressure. Yeah, yeah. But um, like stuff like that, people overlook when it comes to blood pressure with simple little wins to bring your blood pressure down a couple of points. Hmm, yeah. Um, but yeah, it is becoming a silent killer or. Um, something which is completely overlooked at until it's too late. You know what I, I find fascinating too here in both cases, and this isn't just, like I said, this isn't just like a product plug type thing, but the stuff that we're talking about with these supplements, this is something that if it's going to work for you, you're going to see it. You know, you're know, you you're going to be able to tell a difference. If you're taking your blood pressure and it's you know 140 over you know 90 or whatever, and it's consistently or 140 over 100 consistently, and you're to use this product and you see it come down, then you're gonna you're going to be able to do a one plus one, you know, equals two. It's gonna make sense if you're having trouble sleeping, and you either use Dr. Dean's product here or you combine this stuff yourself. You are going to see or you're gonna see a result. You know, within it's not like. It's, I mean, even growth hormone, I'm, I ask myself, like, is this worth it? Is this even doing anything? But you, this is, this is measurable. You know, these are, these are measurable things that you can, you can actually take a supplement that's going to change something. And I, I think that that's, that's what I like about what you're doing the most here. And, uh, and I appreciate, I appreciate everything you're doing here with us. We're, so we're on the, the kidney and blood pressure stack still. Is there anything else that we haven't covered there yet? Um, no, I mean, just uh, I just find it interesting that others that put out kidney products, like I say, don't go anywhere near the sort of dosages that we're prepared to go to. Hmm. And again, again, like I said, both me and Lee, just from day one, it's been all about the health of bodybuilders. Yeah. Like the, the, the whole point behind me joining Supplement Needs as a formulator with Lee was that I, I said to him at the start, if we can make one product brand which covers every base of a supplemental form for bodybuilders where they can just go to your website go to the section of supplement needs and click and buy everything that they need all in one place yeah rather than going on amazon or iherb or any other you know um, nutritional supplement website you have one brand where you know that everything is you know dosed efficaciously yeah 
and that it's all quality controlled and you're basically getting what you're paying for that's important too especially with the cost of the cost of bodybuilding is not cheap i mean so if i'm going to pay for something i want it i want it to work let's move on to what i've been real well i was really excited about the sleep stack too but i want to talk liver let's uh tell me more about this we talked about it a little bit before this is the one i think i'm most excited about so the liver i think we, we will go to the fourth slide which is the health implications of aas for the liver okay I'll so find that one. It, this is from my talk, which I gave up body power. It's a slide from the talk I gave up body power. Okay. So we, we touched on with the um, health um, health implications of AES. All right. Looks like I've got it. All right. So. Having a hard time getting it to fit under my screen for some reason, but we've we've got it here. There we go. Cool. So, if we look at the health implications of AS with regards to the liver, we, we know from straight off the hepatotoxicity of the oral 17 alpha alkylated derivatives. So, all the oral steroids, when they get metabolized at the liver, it puts hepatic strain. It's a toxic cascade in order to um, metabolize those compounds. And again, because of the are involved in second pass metabolism of the liver. Mm -hmm. So obviously, when we methylate the compound, that's to, again, increase the bioavailability so the com compound goes back into circulation. Um, what can happen here over time is that we can end up with cholestasis or bile backflow. So our, our bile ducts are what, again, feed bile into our small intestine to help remove, you know, fat-soluble compounds and, again, aid in feces production so i guess when we look at how drugs are eliminated from the body they can either be eliminated via respiratory so breathing out hmm. they can be eliminated via renal so your kidneys and urine or they can get eliminated by the biliary or through the renal tract um sorry through your um your anal tract which would be you know in your feces okay um so when we look at how androgens work at the liver the first thing that you can do, like I said, is cause cholestasis. So that's where um, cholesterol that's getting repackaged at the liver ends up um, forming like crystals. Okay. These can then, when they're being pushed out of the, the liver, down into the bile ducts for elimination in the intestine, they can block the bile ducts themselves. Mm. Mm. Now, bile can't flow efficiently, and you have this backflow where the... Um, Compounds that are trying to get eliminated from the liver actually flow back into the liver themselves mm. and cause toxicity yeah. because if they can't get cleared. Um, the other thing that can happen at the liver um, through, again, testosterone's fault is hepatic lipase, which is an enzyme which breaks down HDL. So when we take um, super physiological levels of androgens, that increase in testosterone can cause an increase in hepatic lipase, which destroys your HDL. Hmm. Okay, so you're telling me that this and this, so this is how using gear can lower. I have my HDL has been stuck at like 26 for some time, and and that's you know even with HRT. So this this is potentially what I'm looking at right now. Correct. Okay. Correct. And and then obviously what influences lowering hepatic lipase is estrogen. Okay. So that's where the, the testosterone to estrogen ratio comes into play that there, you know, there's different individual um, ratios towards that number that will control, say, for example, our hepatic health okay. and obviously H HDL production. Um, as another artifact of that, then we can cause the formation of small, dense LDL particles. So we will talk about these discussing the heart stack. These are the nasty little guys that we don't want forming when mm. it comes to cholesterol metabolism. Okay. The final one, and this one shocked a lot of people at Body Power, is that we have these stem cells. So we know the liver can heal itself. How it heals itself when it's damaged with, say, fibrosis or hepatitis, hepatitis, I mean, is we have these bone marrow derived stem cells which can filtrate into the liver and basically, you know, start um, mitotic cell division and create new liver tissue. 
Yeah. But when the androgen receptor is activated in the liver, it suppresses that ability for them stem cells to enter a liver to heal itself. So now we can see where we can lead to events of carcin uh, carcinomas of the liver when it comes to steroid use. Hmm. Because of that blocking of these stem cells to pass into the liver to to heal itself. Yeah. So that, that is something where someone say stops taking oral steroids and continues to run a cycle, thinking that they're giving their liver a break to heal itself. It's just not going to happen because of this androgen receptor activation. Interesting. Huh. Okay. So with the liver stack, the first part was the bile support so what i believed was that was so important to prevent this cholestasis of bile backflow so you never get this event of um backflow of any of the metabolites that have occurred in the liver to cause a um i guess secondary toxicity again yeah so what we're doing there is trying to make the bile ducts um, as clear as possible to allow you know the the contents of the liver to flow into the bile ducts to mix with bile and pass into the intestines. Hmm. So what I've done there is we, we gave a synthetic form of bile, so ox bile. Okay. It's very chemically similar to our own bile, so we can use it as a substitute. Hmm. Um, again, if you look at a contest prep scenario, as the diet goes on, a lot of people resort to the strategy of lowering dietary fat. Sure. But without dietary fat being ingested, we lose that stimulation of the gallbladder because, again, bile is being produced to emulsify fat mm. and adjust the pH of the small intestine. Okay. So if, we're not, if we drop to a point where we're not taking in a sufficient amount of fat to increase our need for bile production, we can see that bile drop off. Yeah. So now we, what we're doing there is we're providing a source of bile with the ox bile. Hmm. And then we're using a compound which a lot of people seem to misunderstand when it comes to liver health and protecting the liver, as I like to call it, is Tudka. Hmm. So Tudka's role is actually as a bile salt. What does that mean? So again, so again we have salt within our bile which conjugate to form bile itself. Okay. So... When we take Tudka, we're, we're actually helping with this conjugation for bile production. Hmm. It, it's not inherently, you know, detoxing the liver or repairing the liver. It's aiding again in that bile backflow from um, occurring. Okay. So when we're taking Tudka, we're again aiding with bile flow to prevent that cholestasis. Okay. The, oh, the other issue with Tudka is when we look at some of the studies, and this is more so with methanol and alcohol, if we co-ingest certain supplements with Tudka, there is potential for the liver cells to uptake extra amounts with the Tudka when it's, you know, generating um, bile. Hmm. So it, it may not be wise to take Tudka at the same time or around the same time of using oral steroids. I've, I've heard that before. I've heard people say use it maybe before, maybe after, but that you could actually increase damage uh so when you say when you say it may uptake more it may uptake more what so say for example your liver is um me me metabolizing a certain amount of toxic substance okay that's getting um excreted from the liver okay if you, if totka is present there is a possibility that those toxic compounds get actually uptaken with the totka into the cells because oh. obviously your, ce your, your cells are taking the Tudka in to yeah. help generate bile. Yeah. So, so you may, causing... you're driving more toxins in is what you're telling me. Uh, yeah. Okay, I got much. you. I got you. Without, wow. without the removal of them. Yeah. So that, that was like the basic concept to the first part with the ox bile and the Tudka and aiming at bile backflow. Huh. The other one then was choline and inositol. So choline and inositol have a relationship in the liver when it comes to fat metabolism. Yeah. So... The, the liver itself helps with triglyceride elimination. It helps with packaging of HDL and LDL. So that's where we make most of our HDL and LDL. With choline and acetol, that makes sure that we are um, packaging and eliminating triglycerides correctly. Hmm. So we're preventing um, deposits of um, fat 
fat pockets within our liver to cause fatty liver disease. Yeah. So that fat again, and because it's visceral fat, it, it can be quite toxic. So what we're doing there again is we're aiming and making sure that we have healthy lipid metabolism occurring and healthy lipid uh, elimination. Hmm. Um, so again, we've come with the, the dose that's generally that you see purported. 42 is a gram of choline and a gram of inositol. So we, we've gone close to that with 800 of each. Okay. But then when you look at the other two, we have 800 milligrams of tudke and 1,000 milligrams of ox bile. And again, when it comes to cost, the cost of this product for the amount of tudke that's in it, I, I don't think there's any other product in the market which m- matches it on cost. Hmm, okay. So... Um, again we're looking at what we can fit in the capsule size and obviously the serving size of eight capsules we took precedence over a slightly large amount of tot kit and going to, <laughs> to the to the gram of choline and acetal. okay um, then the final part like we touched on with sleep and COMT was the phase 2 and estrogen metabolism support yes um, so I, I think we'll skip the fourth the fifth slide is a little more complex. Okay. Um, that has all the steroid pathways of the body. I think we'll just go to the last slide, six. Okay. It's a brief overview of estrogen metabolism as it occurs at the liver. So all right. it's not just, it's not just um, estradiol that we're interested in here. We have estrone, which is E1, and estriol, which is E3. Okay. And the three of them have a, an interlinked relationship. So estradiol, which comes from aromatase production from testosterone, can't get converted to estriol, which is E3, or can get converted to estrone E1. Okay. So someone could have symptoms of high estrogen, but their estradiol could be low. Interesting. Okay. Okay, so, so would you suggest that if somebody's getting their estrogen, if they feel like they're having estrogen issues, uh, can can you get all three of those tested then? Would you suggest that people did that regularly, or when would the case be that you'd want to look at all three of them? I'd say if there was a case where estradiol came back, say, low, uh, but you still had side effects from high estrogen production, mm. then you may want to see what's happening with estrone or estriol. Okay, interesting. Um, it's not something that I, I think someone should have regular. Uh, estradiol should be enough to give you an indication of what's happening on a low level. Okay. Because obviously, when we're looking at regular blood work, we don't want to get into um, spending a lot of money with diagnostics that may just give us data for the sake of it. Yeah. And actually, giving us actionable data. Okay. Um. So what what we're actually looking at here? This is interesting. So this is from this is um a screenshot of someone's data actually from a Dutch test. Okay. So a Dutch test is a dry urinary um, metabolite test. So basically you collect urine over four points of the day and then they're able to analyze what metabolites have come out in your urine. Mm. So if we look at this person, they have sky high estradiol. Little red arrow, it's right off the charts. And this person was experiencing high estrogen side effects mm. so we, we just wanted to confirm what was happening to that on a metabolic level yeah so for estradiol to get eliminated it gets converted to estrone e1 and then from estrone we can go on various different paths we can mm. go down the sip one a1 route to two hydroxy estrogen so that's two oh one yeah so that's a, a beneficial metabolite because that gets removed by COMT. If you follow the arrow across, we have this little arrow here that's going from COMT. So 2-hydroxyestrone gets methylated to 2-methoxyestrone, and that gets eliminated in your urine. Hmm. Okay. Then you have estrone going to 4-hydroxyestrone. So this, again, is another enzyme, CYP enzyme in your liver, CYP1B1. So 4-hydroxyestrone is a nasty estrogen. Mm. It's the one that we don't want building up in our body. Really? When you say, what do you mean by this now? Nasty estrogen versus, say, so, something else that wasn't necessarily as so bad. 
So 4-hydroxyestrone has the potential to form what's known as a quinone molecule. Okay. So quinones are toxic substances in our body which can interchelate between our DNA. Okay. So it can, it's an actual carcinogenic compound. No kidding. All right. So if you look at this person's data, they are forming 4-hydroxyestrone mm. in, in high amounts. Yeah. So when they form quinones... Quinones can either attack your DNA or they get eliminated by phase two metabolism in the liver with glutathione. Okay, yeah. So the last day we were speaking about, I formulated liposomal glutathione with supplement needs as an adjunct to the liver stack. Yes. So obviously glutathione is one of the key antioxidants or liver conjugates for removing toxic substances. Interesting. It's making more sense to me now too. It, it so only now, took me it only took me listening to you like three other times. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you see why this person in their blood work had low glutathione. Okay. Because their body was having to try and deal with all them quinones by removing them through conjugation to glutathione. I gotcha. So ideally we want to prevent 4 hydroxyestrone from being produced. But we also want to make sure that when it is produced, that we either have sufficient levels of glutathione to detoxify if it gets converted to a quinone, mm. or that we have sufficient amounts to support COMT to methylate. Mm. So you can see 4-hydroxyestrone goes through methylation detox. And that's where it comes back to making sure that we have these compounds to ensure COMT is working hmm. correctly. So what, what I have in the liver stack is calcium D-glucrate. So calcium D-glucrate doesn't necessarily act on the liver. What it does is we have glucuronidation, which is a mechanism, again, like the glutathione, in that the glucuronidate um, is attaching itself to, say, 2-hydroxyestrone to make it more water-soluble. Hmm. So unless something is water-soluble our kidneys can't eliminate it via the urine because it can't what urine is aqueous okay so these compounds like estrogen and that they are aromatic they are um fat loving mm, okay so we want to make it into a more um hydrophilic compound which means that it likes to be in water interesting and that's why that's why we do these transformation reactions like attaching to glutathione or attaching to glucurate okay. is that we're making it then more water soluble for elimination interesting okay okay now the interesting thing that comes down with calcium d glucurate is that we have certain beneficial bacteria in our gut which in most cases keep things under control whereas we can have these opportunistic bacteria that actually produce um, glucuronidase enzymes. Hmm. So now you've produced a estrogen metabolite which is conjugated to glucurate for re removal. As that estrogen is passing out to be removed from your body, these nasty bacteria are actually cleaving off that glucurate and sending the estrogen back into your body. Hmm. So that's where it comes down to, again, a side effect of managing estrogen metabolism is taking care of your gut. That's interesting. And again, that could be a whole other discussion on, on a bigger tangent, but that th these certain bacteria produce this glucuronidase enzyme, so they're actually cleaving off the glucury, feeding on it, and then sending the estrogen back into your system. So as you're trying to eliminate it, they're pushing it back in. Okay, okay. So um, the final thing in the liver stack would be um, DIM. Yes. So if we look, what, what DIM is doing is preferably pushing estradiol to estrone and then estrone to the 2-hydroxyestrone. Mm. So it's pushing it to that not-so-bad metabolite of estrone so that that can be methylated for removal. Okay. So what we're doing there is we're supporting the metabolism of the estrone for elimination. Okay, that makes sense. We're not, you know, slowing down aromatase or how estrogen is produced. We're aiding in how it's removed from the body. Yeah, yeah. You're helping to break it down into something that's 
easily to, or you're helping to convert it into something that's easy to break down is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I'm following, I'm following along. I think I'm following you a little bit more than I did last time. And it's, <laughs> it's all, the pieces are making a little bit more sense to me. My brain's feeling a little bit overloaded at the moment, but this is, this is good. I think, I think I'm following along and hopefully our listeners are too, uh, you know, getting to have you back here. Um, so dim, you've got that at a hundred milligrams. Now I, I, I take it that that's because in conjunction, that's, that's where you feel that's a, a good dose. Cause I've, I've seen people dose it all the way up to like 400 milligrams, but this is in conjunction with a lot of other stuff happening. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a half serving. So per daily, oh, serving, there's two, I 200 see. milligrams, just 200 milligrams per day, which is pretty average then that's like a solid dose. So. Yeah, but like I said, then on top of that, you're getting a gram of calcium d glucarine. Right, right. Which, so, in which again combo. is a me- which is a mega dose as well. Yeah. So in combo, that that makes a lot of sense, man. This yeah. is uh, how long did it take you to to put this one together? Out of curiosity, uh, and was this the same thing? Was this out of your own yeah. personal yeah, I mean, use this, that you decided yeah. to develop this one? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of you find the stacks come from my own personal use of yeah. maintaining my own health. And again, like I've always said, knowledge should be shared. So there's no point in me keep myself healthy when I can put stuff out there that people can follow in pursuit and stay healthy themselves. I, well, I, I appreciate you sharing everything you are with us. You had one more product, the heart stack. But honestly, man, I we're past an hour now and I'm feeling overloaded at this point. If I'm feeling <laughs> overloaded, I'm sure some of our listeners are too. <laughs> Yeah. I, I got a question. So I I, uh, I posted up uh, on Instagram the other day that we were going to be doing this conversation. And I had several people say, hey, uh, are, are supplement needs available in the U.S.? And I said, well, listen, I'm just going to ask Dr. Dean himself when I get him on the line. Uh, what what What's the story there? So Lee will ship to the U.S. So unfortunately, there's a glitch with the website that when you go to order say internationally to Australia, US, um, the UAE, it says that the shipping is 199 pounds. And a lot of people send me screenshots going, hey man, what's the story with this yeah. <laughs> shipping? Oh God. But, but unfortunately it defaults to that high value, but there is a note then for you to contact them to arrange shipping. Okay, okay. So he, he will ship worldwide. And at the moment he is looking at distributors in Canada and the US. Oh, that'd be badass. So, uh, so at least then you're going to eliminate. At the moment, I think the shipping to the U.S. is about twenty to twenty-five dollars. Okay. Okay. But um, like we we've had quite a lot of people using it in the U.S. and fed back to us on the likes of the sleep stack and the kidney and blood pressure. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm excited to give this stuff a try too. I uh, I wanted to ask you too before we go. Uh, tell me what's going on with your own bodybuilding. Guys, before we started up, uh, Dean was fiddling with his light behind him and closing the blinds. And I'm thinking to myself, this dude's back is looking freaking thick and wide. What, <laughs> how's your training going? Oh, it's going well, Scott. So like last time we spoke, um, I was sort of just heading into, you know, getting back into a structured routine with everything that happened last year. Yeah. And then obviously my, uh, my son was born in the middle of February. So it's been it's been interesting managing bodybuilding and watching my son grow and but yeah it's going really well. Um, I, I bet, man, that's awesome. Are you you working with Jordan still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still working with Jordan and like um, we've still so much to play with at the moment. Like I'm sitting this morning, I've done check-in photos and I was two hundred and twelve point five pounds. Nice and lean so, too, I'm sure, from what I've seen in your pictures. Yeah, we're, we, we've uh, like the key thing here with. with Jordan has been every week we've progressed really really slowly okay like we, we've gone in the last six weeks from 207 to 212 with, with no changes no Just kidding staying consistent with the diet and the supplementation what's uh what's your what's your favorite body part to train and what's your favorite exercise for that body part um god I've seen you do I'd a lot say, of t-bar row videos so that's where I was gonna I, lean but yeah, yeah, T bars. I like T bars. I'm quite strong, and if anyone yeah. wants some, uh, wants a quick laugh, just go to my Instagram page of last week at work. What happened? <laughs> I had the same instance happened to me again, where the attachment came out as I went to T bar. <laughs> <eight. laughs> and yeah, so you so, you, you dumped it. Uh, so yeah, literally, as I pulled up, the plates came with me, and then the 
attachment to back lift it at the air and all eight plates fly off to oh. <laughs> I, I saw that the first time that happened. It was it was shortly <laughs> after we recorded the first time. And I, I'm watching this, I've got my phone, I'm looking at Instagram. All right, Dean's setting up. He's gonna he's gonna pull some serious weight here, and I'm waiting for it. And then all of a sudden, you just dump the whole thing. It was not what I expected at all. Yeah, it happened. It happened last week. I thought I had it secure, so then yeah, I have a picture of it on the post where I literally just got a, bar, a, a dumbbell and just anchored it on top. So for people that don't understand, um, I train at work, and we have basically minimal equipment so i invested in like a pivot attachment to do t-bars yeah you literally slot it into a, a weight plate in the ground nice. and it just anchors itself in there normally it stays you just give it a little quick turn it's like solid but uh yeah twice that's happened now so that's and that's funny, why i'm man. always wary of doing t-bars at work <laughs> <laughs> well i've gotten away lucky and i've done it twice on night shift with no one around <laughs> because the comedy of that if you were in the gym and <laughs> oh god no yeah, everybody would be like that was the guy that was the guy that did it for the next month so but it, it was i close though t-bars would that be what, what what's your favorite I like, exercise i like t-bars um i suppose the body part that i really like training is legs oh yeah legs, just just something gratifying about training legs that I, I don't think you get with any other body <laughs> part i'm totally i'm with you 100 percent on that one that's that's so true like yesterday, yesterday the final exercise for legs was a, a widow maker on the hack squat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where a three second dead stop in the bottom. Yeah. And by the the twentieth rep, like I was seeing stars, my head was <laughs> busting with my blood pressure. But yeah, it's just something like that when you finally finish the set and you rack it, you just sit there taking in a couple of deep breaths. You go, wow, I've just done that. Yeah, it's it, you like I think you used the word gratifying. That's a very yeah. that's a good word for it. Yeah, um, it's just. So, uh, but let me know though too. Supplement needs. What's your URL, and uh, and how can people reach out to you as well and follow you on Instagram and everything? So I'm on Instagram at d e a n s t m. Um, supplement needs is www.supplementneeds.co.uk. There's um, a whole other host of supplement brands in there, including Jordan Peters, because they are the um, distributor for. Jordan Peters, trained by JP Nutrition. Oh, cool. Like, yeah, they're just starting that up, right? Yeah, I was I co-formulated with Jordan on a lot of products. So, nice. nice. Um, if one of people want to pick it up, that's probably where they're going to get it from is through Supplement Needs. Awesome, man. Um, and I think I, I have a discount code. I don't really use it that often on social media, but I think Dr. Dean should save some money on the website. All right. Well, we'll definitely – I'll put that up then in the show notes. And, guys, if you do want to pick anything up from Supplement Needs – uh, use the code and for sure if if you're in the u.s and you want to check them out then uh, just drop them an email and uh, they'll they'll take care of you on the cost of shipping it won't be 200 pounds uh, <laughs> dean thank you so much man this has been really cool i really appreciate you taking the time to i mean to come on here and to just share your insight behind all this stuff because there's there's no there's no flash this is no proprietary blends you're explaining no. to us why you've put these things together the way you have. And if people choose to, they can buy your products. If they choose to, they can put it together themselves. But I think it yep. makes sense that to just buy it all in one thing, it probably would be a lot less of a hassle. And, and in the end, I'm going to guess it would probably be more cost effective. So I, I really appreciate everything you're doing here, man, and everything you're doing for bodybuilding. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. I, I really thank you so much. Thank you very much, Scott. No, it's my absolute pleasure to come on again and share with everyone what I know. So hopefully we get back on again and we can go over maybe the heart stack and some other things. We could keep going all night on something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If I was left to. And, and I'm sure if we got into bodybuilding, then that would be just a whole um, other, uh, you know, exercising <laughs> and nutrition. Let's, let's definitely, please, I'd love to do this again. Awesome. Awesome. I will for sure. All right, guys. For another episode of Advices Radio. With Dr. Dean St. Mart, I'm Scott McNally. We will see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Thank you.